Good morning, and welcome to the Guilford Community Church on this World Communion Sunday, and welcome back to our sanctuary. The beautiful flowers, uh, Linda Vivo put the arrangements together, but the beautiful flowers under the cross are in memory of Carolyn's mom, and the flowers in front of the pulpit are given by Carol Mixon in memory of her sister, Susan Kramer. And something incredibly important happened 90 years ago today. 90 years ago today, the lady we know as Mary Flynn was born. And I, I think Mary is watching the service, and I, I just feel we're going to sing happy birthday to Mary Flynn. went pretty well. Maybe next week we'll actually sing a hymn or two. This morning we, we aren't going to be doing that, but uh, each week we hope to incorporate more of our normal elements. And I, I welcome you again. I look forward to worshiping together with you. Thank you. 
That was beautiful. Thank you, Minnie and Alex. Please join me now in a word of prayer. We greet this beautiful morning <clears throat> with gratitude, thankful for our lives, for the gift of this day filled with possibility. May we be hopeful in the face of disappointment, open in the face of our limitations, steadfast in the face of challenges, light-hearted in the face of gloom, humble always in the face of success, loving in the face of evil, unsettled in the face of privilege. And may we always be close to one another in the face of disagreement, that through our lives, love might shine as it did through the life of Jesus, whose words we now repeat. <clears throat> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And then our scripture reading this morning comes from the beautiful words of Psalm 8. O Lord, our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God, crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hand. You have put all things under their feet, all the sheep and oxen, the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the path of the seas. O Lord, our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And now I invite you again in a moment of prayer. Um, I mentioned last week that Mel Van Dyke had had a heart attack and is recovering, so continue to keep Mel and Shaw in your thoughts and prayers. And for the Littlefield family, Bill's celebration of life takes place down in Holliston, Massachusetts on Tuesday. We're going to Facebook live stream that service so that you can be as present as possible. And um, the Wilsons, Patrick and Kim, mentioned that they've recently lost a family member due to COVID-19, and we certainly want to keep our president and all of our elected officials who are suffering from that, as well as loved ones who aren't doing well today. So mindful of all of these people, as well as the things that are on our heart, please join me in a moment of prayer. Each of us comes to this moment and to this place after a week filled with engagements and commitments, challenges and opportunities. Yet we take time to gather in the midst of our busyness because we experience a deeper sense of our need for community and for at times to be attentive to our own and one another's hearts and dreams and goals. In this brief time we are together, we bring those things to mind, to heart, and we place them here in the midst of this gathering and call ourselves to be attentive to them, to live with love and compassion, wholeness, justice and beauty. May we center our thoughts on the place these things have in our lives. And throughout our time together, may we be strengthened in our commitment to living them out, not only in the time that we are together, 
but through the whole of the living of our lives. This is our prayer. Amen. I will arise with all my daughters. I will arise against my foes. I will arise with all the mothers. I will carry all their woes. I will arise to fight for freedom. I will arise though faced with fears. I will arise against all hatred while my eyes are veiled in tears. I will arise for religious freedom, for a rich diversity. I will arise for all the weary, for each lonely refugee. I will work for all our women who deserve equal pay. I will work for all our children who await a better day. Sisters, oh, stand with me. Rise up and in to spread love across this bitter land. I will arise for love and justice that we may see a better day. I will arise in peace and service for a world in disarray. I will arise with all my brothers for all those who cannot stand. I will rise with all our fathers who have lost a home and land. I will rise to build up bridges for this broken world we see. I will tear down walls between us that divide you and me. Brothers, oh, Stand with me, rise up hand in hand, oh, stand with me, we will rise to spread love across this bitter land. Stand with me, rise up hand in hand. Oh, stand with me, we will arise to spread love across this bitter land. Thank you, AJ. That was beautiful. (laughs) In six days, October 10th, I will turn 61 years old. Hard to believe, isn't it? Hard to believe, except I've got hair growing where it isn't supposed to. And spots that used to be quite hairy aren't. Wrinkles and age spots, check. I bruise easier, check. 
Don't hear as well as I used to. Check. Don't run nearly as fast as I used to. Check. 61, maybe I do believe it. <laughs> but I wouldn't trade it for a minute. My life, like every life, has been visited by sorrow and pain, but most of my days have been seasoned by joy and love. 61 years ago, just after 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning, I made my debut appearance. All 5 pounds, 13 ounces, and 18 inches of me. Like every infant, I was completely clueless as to who I was. But since that day, my understanding of who I am has changed and evolved. I thought about all the identities I've taken on over the years, some chosen, others not. Before I understood that I was Clayton and Phyllis Graham's son, a boy, at some point, about five or six months into my journey, I began to have a little sense that I was Michael. A little later, I understood that I was part of the Graham family. Felt lucky to be so. I was a son, a boy. In time, I'd be a brother. I went to a Catholic church and a Catholic ele elementary school, but so did all of my friends. I don't think I understood that I was Catholic until a neighbor moved in who was Baptist. Now we never tried to get them on our team, but they certainly felt obligated to get us on their team. But we were Catholic, not Baptist. Now my family didn't talk a lot about ethnicity, but in fifth grade at Our Lady of Victory Elementary School, my friends began to relentlessly tease Johnny Pulaski because he was Polish. Johnny Polak is what they called him, said his house was dirty and it smelled bad too. Now I had been to Johnny's house before he was Johnny Polak and I know it didn't smell bad and it wasn't dirty, but I kept that to myself. Now, I didn't call him Johnny Pollock, but my silence made me complicit. I think that was the first time I really remember being disappointed in myself. Somewhere along the way, it, it became important to me that I was from Michigan, a Michigander. The only state you can use your hand to show people where you came from. In 1967, a station wagon filled with black people drove through my neighborhood. And I realized I wasn't like them. Now, I never thought of myself as white, but I knew I wasn't black. And I didn't completely understand at eight years old why most of our neighbors didn't want those people moving in next door. But I probably did feel that they would be happier with their own people. A year later, 1968, we flew to Los Angeles in the winter, spent a day in Tijuana. For the first time in my life, I saw poverty. I didn't then realize that I didn't do anything to deserve being born to middle-class parents, just luck of the draw. But today, I know just how privileged my life has been. I didn't choose to be privileged, but knowing that colors how I see myself in the world. That same summer, we visited New England got a greater sense of our history. I realized in a broader, deeper sense that I was an American and proud to be so from sea to shining sea. At nine years old, I knew right then New England was where I wanted to live. I wanted to be a New Englander. 
that same year, 68, we bought a Buick Opal. Loved that car. We bought it from a Buick dealer, brand new. But some of our neighbors didn't like us buying a car that was made in Germany. I remember being perplexed. Don't people in Germany have a right to make a living? Of course, I didn't speak those words. That same summer, 1968, the Detroit Tigers won the World Series. My grandpa took me to game three. I'd have sworn on a huge stack of Bibles I would never root for the Red Sox. <laughs> but loyalty is not one of my best characteristics. In high school, I became a Norfolk Mustang. Mustang pride made me ever so thankful I wasn't a hawk or an eagle or a raider. Four years later, I com completely embraced my identity as a Michigan State Spartan. Being a Spartan meant I hated the Buckeyes and the Wolverines. And when Magic Johnson led the Spartans to a national championship over Larry Bird and the Indiana Sycamores, Indiana State Sycamores, I was high as a kite. Not literally. But I remember walking proudly through the streets of East Lansing. If you had told me in 1979 that Larry Bird would be my favorite basketball player, I'd have said, you're on drugs. Spring break, my junior year at Michigan State, I became Cindy's husband. A year and a half later, I became a father, still one of my favorite identities. That is until at 49, I became Poppy, Grandpa. Now the most exclusive identity I've ever had was my seven or eight year stint as a born-again Christian where the world was black and white, good guys and bad guys, us and them. That's not everyone's experience in that world, but it was ours, us and them. Like my religious identity and my sports identity, Lions fan turned Patriots. Wish they were playing today, don't you? <laughs> but like my religious and sports identity, my political identity has been fluid, sometimes ideological, oftentimes pragmatic, sometimes quick to demonize, other times more universal and inclusive. Now, some of those identities I didn't choose. I didn't choose to be Clayton and Phyllis's son. I would have if I could have, but I didn't have a choice. I'm heterosexual. But I don't remember the day I decided that, because I didn't. If you remember the day you made that decision, let's talk. <laughs> Other identities I did have some say in. One of my favorite identities that fills me with great pride, gives me a reason to get up every day, is being the pastor of the Guilford Community Church. I can't imagine not being that. But what do you know? One day I won't be. Someone else will have that honor. The psalmist asked an identity question. What is humanity that you are mindful of them? The, result, the psalmist reminds us that every other identity we have, chosen or not, is penultimate at best. The one that trumps all other identities is that we are mortal. One day I will and you will be no more. And death is a doorway to whatever is next. So we are mortal, but from a theological perspective, all of us, every one of us, are children of God. We share a common family tree with all others. And from an anthropological perspective, we are earthlings. 
Life is a chemical process that began in the waters. And evolution has worked its wonders, but it's made us tribal. But the good news is that good religion, good religion pushes us out beyond that tribal nature. And it reminds us that we are all kin, black and white, red and yellow, Christian and Jew, Buddhist and Muslim, believer and non-believer, gay and straight and trans, and all of us, brothers and sisters. And so on this World Communion Sunday, let's celebrate the great kinship we have with all others. Amen. And one of the things families do is they eat together. When they eat, they tell stories. And the story we always tell when we gather around this table is that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread. He blessed it and broke it and said, my body will be broken like this bread. And then he took a cup of wine and said, this cup symbolizes a new covenant, a new relationship sealed with my very life. When you drink it, Drink it remembering me. And so now in the name of Jesus, the crucified one, I offer to you the bread of life. And now in the now in the name of the now now in the name of the crucified but ever living Christ we offer to you the cup of the new covenant. Amen.
Thank you, Alex and May and Carolyn and AJ for all the beautiful music. Thank you for coming. Special thanks to our diaconate and especially to Stacy Pate who provided the bread from around the world. And now having gathered together for worship, may we go forth with a great sense of peace and joy as we aspire to season our world and this day with love and grace. Amen.